Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Thursday Facebook Live. Tom Shirley here, ready to take you on a tour through the Bible. Share some things about spiritual gifts today. So as is our custom, we will have a lag time because we have to wait for people to get on here. It's like a two-minute lag apparently between me talking and you getting it. And I see Marie, Miss Faithful, is on there. And of course my wife, who has to be here because we're married. And uh, just kidding, I think she likes it. But uh, Asia, I see you're there. Thank you for being here tonight. Christian, hello. Good to see you on here. And uh, if you could uh, invite friends, share the video. That would be awesome. We can get a, a, a million people to watch this tonight. That would be great. Hey, Cat McKenzie. <clears throat> Thank you for being here. All right, if you could share it, invite your friends, threaten your neighbors, tell them they have to watch it, or you're going to sick your dog on their flower garden. I would appreciate that. Hey, David, thank you for being here tonight. We'll give just a couple minutes, just another minute or so, and then I'll start uh, doing some review uh, to lay into what we're going to talk about tonight. I don't, hey, David, thanks, man. I don't have any deep revelations. I'm just trying to get through the list of spiritual gifts and share some things that the Lord has talk, spoken to me and and uh, just kind of, you know, get people thinking because maybe somebody will get some really cool revelation and, and be able to share with me and help me understand more. Hi, Christian. I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you. All right. Who else is going to jump on? Any second now, right? Chrissy. Hey, Chrissy. Thank you for jumping on here. All right, I'm going to go ahead and just start doing some review from the last several weeks that we've been teaching. Uh, the first five weeks, four weeks that we spoke, we, we covered the gift of prophecy uh, extensively. We talked about it in many different aspects, took some directions that I had not expected, but I enjoyed it. And uh, uh, so we did that for a little while, and then we went ahead and jumped over into some other uh, groups of giftings, and I'll do a review on those. If you want to get the gist of how we got to where we are from where we were, uh, what we taught about, you'd need to go back and look at the series. You can go to our YouTube channel called Throne Builders, and you'll find the Helping the Heart series. You can also find them on my page. Uh, if you'd like to get them there, that would be awesome. If you can, or you can watch them on YouTube. So, um, so we're gonna uh, let's just do a quick review of the different groupings of spiritual gifts that we spoke that we've spoken about. Uh, we looked at the group of giftings in Ephesians chapter four: apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, and uh, these are commonly called the fivefold office gifts. And and I shared some of my perspective about the gifts and some things that I believe the Lord has taught me about them. Uh, but uh, primarily, the main thing that I really brought to the surface was that if you really study the, the concept behind that particular category of giftings, there is no office in the sense of position. It actually very clearly says there that every believer has one of those gifts. So it's, it can't be, we, we've had this mindset of this fivefold office gifts, like these are the five offices that are supposed to rule the church or run the church. But I think that's a, a very, a, a, <clears throat> I'm sorry, it, that's true, but not in the sense of, you know, there's the office of the apostle and he's, he oversees this, and there's the office of the prophet and he oversees this. It's, it's a really uh, damaging concept that's been done to the body of Christ because we think they're this special group of people that get to work in these five giftings, one, one of these five giftings, but it, at, Paul actually plainly says that it really is something that every believer has access to one of these. Uh, so, uh, so we talked about that. You'd have to go back and look at the teaching to really get an idea of where we were. Then we looked at motivation gifts uh, two weeks ago, when, uh, which is in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, where it's prophecy, ministry, teaching, exhortation, ruling, and mercy. And these are commonly called the motivation gifts. And this, this, cat, these, this grouping of giftings uh, is very crucial for the body of Christ. And again, every believer has or is living in one of these gifts. And I think it's interesting that there, there are so many different listings of gifts in the scriptures. There, there are four specific, distinct, different listings where you actually have um, uh, these different gifts that are listed. 
So it's unusual, and a lot of people don't teach on that, and I, and I don't know why. You know, I don't know if it's, there's just mystery behind it, because I, I sure have some questions about it. But, uh, you know, I've learned some stuff and, and uh, from the Lord, and I guess I've heard other people say stuff and read things, and, and that's, that's, you know, all, we all get built into by what a bunch of different people do and say. But uh, these gifts are very important. Every believer has or is one of these people, and it's the thing that compels them. Everyone has a function of apostle or prophet or evangelist or pastor teacher, uh, but in the same way, every believer has a motivation or a compulsion inside of them uh, for for a, a prophecy, ministry, teaching, exhortation, giving, ruling, mercy. You have to go back and look at the teaching I did two weeks ago. Uh, for that, I'm going to be, uh, hey, Stacy, thanks for joining us tonight. I'm going to be uh, doing releasing a webinar series about the spiritual gifts, and that's I'm going to go into a, a good bit more detail on these different categories of gifts. I'm just kind of trying to give a, 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 a pretty thorough general overview of some things that the Lord's taught, taught me. Last week, we went through and looked at what I call the manifestation gifts, because I believe the text lends itself to it, and the manifestation gifts are in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10, and uh, hey, Ray, thank you. God bless you, my friend. Uh, so the, the manifestation gifts are word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, diverse kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues, okay? So uh, these are the, the manifestation gifts. These are the gifts that uh, I believe, and, and what I taught last week is I believe that these are the gifts that the Holy Spirit, this is how he chooses to manifest who manifests, who brings forth these specific gifts when coming together in a, a corporate fellowship. Um, <clears throat> I work with a lot of people on a regular basis, and something that I regularly get thrown back at me is, you know, I don't have the gift of prophecy. False. Every believer has the gift of prophecy, okay, because the gift of prophecy is the fulfillment of the promise that every believer would prophesy, okay, uh, we, and we went into great detail. Numbers chapter 11, uh, um, Moses says, would God, that the Lord would put his spirit on all, uh, the, uh, on all the people and that they would all prophesy. And then in Joel chapter 2, you come and you find that God says, the days will come when I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And then in Acts chapter 2, you see it happen where the spirit of God, comes down upon all flesh and uh, Peter even says this is the fulfillment of what Joel said and Joel was saying that there was a fulfillment coming for what Moses said. Every believer can prophesy. Very, very, very important uh, that every believer understand and recognize that you have that gift, but it's not just the gift of prophecy. Every believer has access to everything that the Spirit of God brings when he comes to live inside of us. But the Holy Spirit is, is the one that wants to determine how these gifts are going to manifest in corporate worship and in ministry. And that's what the manifestation gifts are. That's the, the goal is that when believers come together, hey, Amy, thanks for being here, that when believers, uh, Linda, I see you there, bless you, uh, that when believers come together, the Holy Spirit is supposed to be able to move through the body and cause the body to bring forth the manifestation of the kingdom that he desires, okay? Now, <clears throat> that's, that's dangerous for the current model of church that we have, and I'm not bashing church, but I have some issues with the way some of this stuff is organized and set up because we now have programs, and I'm all for it. I mean, I love the worship, and, and uh, you know, different ministries have different things that they do, and, and all that's great, and I have no problem with it. I, th I think it's powerful, and I'm really big on, on that stuff, and I want to, as God moves us, and we'll be releasing a vision for a plan that we have to be able to, to move uh, to a new location, actually start our first training center in a geographical location. We'll be releasing that soon, uh, so, and we're going to have all that, and we want to have all that, and we love all that, but much leadership in the church uh, is very territorial, and if the pastor or the elders or the deacons or the apostle or the bishop or the prophet or whatever the title of the person that's running the show, if they feel threatened, uh, and oftentimes they do feel threatened by other people that are bringing forth an expression of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, sometimes it's fear, like they're afraid that it might not be God, you know, and that's 
understandable, right? I mean, we don't, <laughs> some weird stuff happens and you kind of question it. Is that God? And I've had quite a few of those moments in my life. My family can attest to some pretty strange happenings that we were like, is that God? And we found out it was, but, um, <clears throat> A lot of leadership gets afraid. There's a, there's a nervousness there, not just that maybe it might be demonic or something unclean, but actually concerned that uh, maybe of other talent. And it's it's not you know I mean some do it deliberately, but most don't. But like an actual fear that if I uh, let other people begin to express, bring forth the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, uh, maybe it's going to minimize me. Maybe it's going to interfere with my agenda. And uh, it's a difficult thing for people that are strong leaders leaders to surrender themselves and let other people be moved by the spirit to bring in his work. And I mean, I personally have never been in, in that type of a setting. When I was in that type of a setting, I was very, you know, very autocratic. I was just, I was that guy, you know? And uh, so I've never actually, I haven't been in that actual position since the Lord has delivered me from all that garbage. Uh, it, yeah, a comfort zone. It's, it's, there's, it's, there's comfort in leadership. There's comfort in being a sheeple, you know, a people sheep where you just kind of, bah, whatever you say kind of thing. Uh, but the spirit of God is really trying to awaken us, you know, he's trying to, uh, get us to recognize that we have power and that he wants to bring forth his power through us. And he wants to not replace us, right? Because there's that really perverse false teaching that says, you know, more of you, less of me. That's God, you know, like Bill Johnson out of Redding, California. Bethel and Redding says, you know, God had less of you when he made you. He doesn't want less of you. He wants more of you to manifest as a daughter, as a son in union and in fellowship with him. Okay. But, um, so the spirit of God wants to manifest through believers when we come together in corporate worship. So when it speaks in first Corinthians chapter 12, verses eight through 10 about these manifestation gifts to one is given the word of wisdom, to one is given the word of knowledge, to one is given prophecy. Uh, it's not saying that you, these, this is the gift you get and you're stuck with it. It's talking about when we come together as believers, Hey, Diana, see you there. God bless you. Uh, when, when we come together as believers, the Holy spirit wants to take every believer as a vessel and bring forth what's needed at that given moment. And I suspect that he would like to really mix things up so that it can be according to his purposes, so that the guy that's always working in word of knowledge, uh, it doesn't get in that rope, but the guy that's over here and just, you know, he operates in, I don't know, as the discerning of spirits, all of a sudden he's the one that's popping off words of knowledge. Why? Because the spirit of God wants there to be... Um, fullness, completion. He wants there to be a diversification in the way that the gifts are manifested. He wants there to be, uh, you know, I, uh, the word diversity, you know, the uh, uh, enemy camps have taken that and really perverted that. But don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid of rainbows. Don't be afraid of stuff like that, you know. Uh, uh, diversity is important. We're all different for a reason. We're on purpose. God designed our DNA so that each one of us that came popping out of the womb would be, you know, different. And you're supposed to be like that. And it's the differences coming together in the manifestation of the Holy Spirit that reveal the kingdom of heaven. Hey, Angela, God bless you. Uh, so, so these gifts, these manifestation gifts, they're, they're something that each believer can move in and out of. It's not a, it's not a static thing. It's a very fluid thing that the spirit of God wants to work through his people. Okay. So those are the three categories of giftings that we've looked at so far, and I have, I have entitled today's teaching the administration gifts because I actually believe that this listing of gifts that I'm going to talk about for a few minutes tonight, I believe that these actually are static gifts and that they are uh, administrative in the sense that they are the ones that are given the charge in the ministry as far as making sure that everything, you know, th because leadership's important. Uh, I speak negative about the way that the current church leadership system is set up, but that doesn't mean that I don't believe in leadership. I do. We have to have it. it there, you know, God has appointed many people to lead, uh, but in, in, in some ways, every believer is appointed to lead, and genuine leadership will lead you, but then will be able to turn around and receive your leadership. And boy, that's, <laughs> that's a can of worms. People have a hard time with that, but that's okay. Uh, that's with being an apostolic uh, uh, forerunner, being in an apostolic move of the Holy Spirit is all about us, about God shaking up the status quo and saying, hey, I'm tired of doing it the way we've been doing it. We need to move forward and go in a new direction. So 
Uh, these gifts, I think you're, I, I believe they're static and I'm just going to kind of share a few thoughts that I have. I don't have any great big revelations on them, but I just want to share it with you. But before I do, I want to go through the scriptures here in first Corinthians chapter uh, 12. Uh, so in verse number eight, for to one is given by the spirit, the word of wisdom to another, the word of knowledge by the same spirit to another faith by the same spirit to another, the gifts of healing by the same spirit. And I think it's really cool how Paul words, the gifts of healing. It's the only one uh, in these manifestation gifts where the word gift is attached to it. And I believe that there is a diversity in the way that the Spirit of God would, would administer healing. And it's very, very important. So it's just, you know, just a kind of a side note, but there's something specific when the Holy Spirit, he gives diverse, uh, different kinds of power gifts to people and healing is a big deal in the manifestation. Every believer is a healer, Okay, every believer has the capacity to bring forth and lay hands on or, or to speak to sickness and disease and, and deal with it. But this is talking about coming together in fellowship with other believers. Okay. All right, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another divers kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these work at that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So he gives to every man by divisions according to what his will is for, for that point in time. Uh, for as the body is one, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, for as the body is one and hath many members... And all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Listen, uh, it's so, so important to get this. In Ephesians chapter 4, the office gifts. It, it's premised on the idea that we are to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Unity is crucial for these gifts to work. And it's the unity of the faith. It doesn't mean the unity of everybody lining up with what the leader says. It doesn't mean everybody lining up with what the denominational doctrine says. It's everybody lining up with the Holy Spirit. And you'll find when the Spirit of God leads you and leads a group of people, oftentimes he's like, ditch the doctrine, man. Just let's come into the kingdom and let's do this thing. So in Ephesians chapter 4, it's about unity. In Romans chapter 12, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye all, unified people coming together, present yourselves, all of you together as one living sacrifice. Be renewed, be uh, transformed by the renewing of your mind, singular. Its unity is so, so crucial uh, for the gifts of the Spirit to operate, but unity with the Holy Ghost. Amen. It's the Spirit of God that we're to be unified with, and it's so crucial for us to really recognize how powerful the Holy Spirit is in, in um, moving us in the direction that he wants to move us. It's unity. Imagine a group of people coming together that are tuned in. Holy Spirit, I'm tuned into you. And I'm tuned into you for the purpose, not because I'm here to worship, not because I'm here to, to receive, but I'm tuned into you because you have something inside of me that you want to bring forth. I, I've never been around a ministry like that, and, I, and I've not been around a ton of ministries, a ton of kingdom ministries. I've been around a few and uh, gotten to know a few people, but I've just I've never seen anything like that, and I've never really heard of anything like that. I know there are some great equipping ministries out there, but a body, a group of people coming together yielded in such a way that they know that, yeah, of course we're here to worship. Of course I'm here to receive, but I also have something inside of me that the Spirit of God wants to bring forth. Spirit of God, establish this for your, for your people right now. I just ask you to just make this a reality and cause this to be something that breaks forth on every, every front in, in, your, in the kingdom. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 15. Oh, boy. Uh, God is going to shake the established thing so hard that by the time he's done shaking it and rebuilding it, everybody's going to be like, what happened to the church? Because it's going to be the church now. So, in any case. Uh, if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Right? So, in other words, like if my foot wakes up one morning and says, hey, dude, I'm not a hand. I don't, I don't belong. Does that mean it doesn't belong? <laughs> no way, man. I need my feet. Right? Uh, if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? 
Uh, if the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? And you know, that, that little verse right there, if the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? That reminds me of a far side comic strip, right? Like one of those weird ones. Um, like they were, you know, they were all weird. Like the ladies driving down the road and looks in the rearview mirror and it says objects in mirror may be closer than they appear, but all that you see is this gigantic eyeball. Doesn't that? No. Okay. In any case, um, there's some cool groups on Facebook that have far side comics and I've really been reading a lot lately. So I'm probably going to be a little less mature tonight than I normally am. Get over it. Um, but now verse 18, but now has God set the members, every one of them in the body as it hath pleased him. Right. So each, every, everything, your, your body, our bodies are designed uh, as God looked at it and said, I'm, this pleases me, I'm going to set it up like this. And truthfully, uh, we're, we're remarkable m machines, you know, mechanisms. It's just inc incredible what God has created us to, with the capacity to do. Oh, uh, let's see, where is it? So, uh, and if they were all one member, where were the body, right? I mean, if you're just a giant hand walking around, you're a freak. You're not a body. It's just, you know, there's no way around that. Uh, and the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Why? Because those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary, right? It's like, it's like you know, what, what's the big deal with the pinky toe? It's just a little feeble part of the body. Yeah, but when you kick that thing on the table in the middle of the night, you suddenly realize, I need this. And, uh, and other, you know, you say other stuff too, but uh, the, every, what we think to be less important often we find is the most important part that God has placed in us, and the same thing is true in the body of Christ. Those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor and our uncomely or our unattractive parts have more abundant comeliness or attractiveness. So in our, on our, in our physical bodies, the, the part, the, there are parts of us that we conceal, not because they're not important, not because we don't need them, not because we don't want them, but because in many ways they're more important. There are parts of our bodies that we guard more carefully, right? Because they, they, there are parts of us that are more crucial, not more important in the sense of, oh, I don't need that. I mean, yeah, you can cut your hand off and live, but I mean, why would you, right? You, that's not what you want. Uh, we want to be, uh, we want to be full and whole people. And uh, some of you have some serious physical issues. Uh, some of you have even lost, uh, you know, body parts. You've lost, it's like I'm seeing a left, left hand pinky right now that somebody lost. And I just, I hurt for you. And I want to remind you that in, in the gospels, it says that Jesus healed the maimed. He put limbs back on and same God that did it then is the same God that does it now. We really need to be believing for those kind of miracles. We need to believe for every kind of miracle, right? Because we need some serious stuff to happen. Um, was it verse 24 for our comely parts have no need right i mean your face is out there you know that's that's the part of you that's out there that's the that's the attractive part of the 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 beneficial part that's out there you don't cover that because that makes sense you don't cover your mouth because your mouth is there for speaking you don't cover your eyes because if you do you can't see Oh, let's see, uh, which we think to be less honorable. Oh, I'm so sorry, I messed up. For our comely parts have no need in verse 24, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And he's, he's making the analogy. Remember that uh, you, you, the, 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 the analogy of the physical body to the body of Christ. He says, whether one member suffer... All the, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it, right? So uh, when, when, when someone is suffering or struggling or going through difficult times, uh, it, it has a, the, the, the power to kind of pull us down. It kind of drags us down a little bit. Uh, not, because, not because of their negativity, but because they're hurting. So in, in the spirit... Uh, uh, a part of, uh, you know, my, my brother in China may have just lost uh, his mother, may have just gotten thrown in prison, may, you know, who knows what, what could have happened, something negative. And whether I ever know that person, whether I ever communicate with that person, whether I ever know that that happened, he's part, he's a member of the body, and so there's, there's an effect in what happens. Okay? It's important for us to recognize that that's how unified we really are. Uh, we are so connected, we've, we've been made one with the Father, but in the same way, we've been made one with each other. 
So you and I are completely unified. I've talked about this a lot the last few weeks. It's so important for us to get this. Uh, denominationalism is going to have to fall. And don't misunderstand me. I can't fellowship with a lot of different groups because they believe some wacky stuff and it really dishonors the, the nature of the Father, the nature of the kingdom. So I can't fellowship with them, but I'm still one with them. You know, I can't, I can't, uh, you know, I can't, but I can because they're part of me. We're one. Uh, so whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. So a believer somewhere in Africa just, just broke through in the gift of tongues and boom, and in the spirit realm, the whole body just kind of boom steps up. Why? Because honor has now been released into the body of Christ and glory to God. There it comes. Okay. So it's, it's important. I'm just, I'm going through this because it really is the bulk of my, my, the time Time that I'm going to spend is going through the scripture tonight and just saying, hey, uh, we're all part of the same thing. And you, if you expect me to line up with what you believe about stuff, to have, to have unity in the body, you miss the point. If I expect you to agree with me completely to have unity, you miss the point. I, I have no problem with you being over there doing what you're doing. But I have to keep my heart and my mind in check. And I have to really strive and say, Father, cause both of us to align with you. Amen. Cause both of us, cause all of us to come in line with you. And, and what we're going to find out is all of us were way off, <laughs> you know. And uh, uh, the, the, father, the father was like right on the money, and he's trying to align us with him. And that's what we need to happen if we would put down our arrogant determination to hold on to the traditions of men that have been handed down to us, we could see the kingdom of heaven expand mightily, 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 mightily. I believe that it could be so powerful that one generation could literally usher in the full manifestation of the kingdom on earth. And, and I'm, I'm convinced of that. I mean, I've been seeing that for years. So in any case, so in verse 27, he, Paul comes down and says, Now you are the body of Christ. Excuse me. You are the body of Christ and members in particular. Okay? And, and I realize he's speaking to a local church here, but this is a universal concept uh, that you see throughout the New Testament. You actually see it throughout Scripture uh, where the, all the people of God are, are one in God's eyes, in God's mind, okay? And the body of Christ is not something that, that, that is um, geographically restrained by a building or by a denomination or anything like that. It's every believer everywhere is part of this because they bring the, the living expression of, of God, of the nature of God, of the nature of the kingdom. Each believer brings an aspect to the table that only they can bring. That's why your DNA is 100% unique and distinctive to you. That's why you alone have the eye pattern you, you have. You alone have the thumbprint, the fingerprints, the hand, the palm print, the footprint, the heel print, the toe print, uh, the voice print. I mean, <laughs> nobody has the voice print. People might be able to uh, imitate you and sound exactly like you to the naked ear, but when you put that on a machine and you gauge the actual voice pattern, you see they're two completely different voices. Why? Because you were made so distinctively because God wanted what, you, what he can bring into the earth to come through your uniqueness, okay? So important to understand this in the heart of God. It's your distinctive uniqueness that he's trying to expose. He's not trying to get you to conform to a Christian culture somewhere. He's trying to actually wake you up to the fact that he wants you to be who you are. You're, you're who you are, man. And it's so important. And I just, you know, it's a good time to tell you, go to ifoundme.biz. And uh, purchase my wife's new book. The Kindle version is available. There's a paperback version available. My wife has lived this. She's pulled our family out of pit after pit after pit through this. When I was just a mess and I couldn't and wouldn't and didn't know how. And if I did know how, I wasn't willing. And uh, she, she lived this. And then she wrote a book about it. And, and uh, the, the, you, find you. Find out who God made you to be. It's important for you. So, uh, so, okay, so we're the body of Christ and members in particular. So then Paul comes in and he says, uh, God hath set some. Now that word set is pretty interesting. It means to settle down. It means to position. Uh, it has the concept of like strategy with it. 
And it, it literally seems to carry with it the concept of fixed, like it's a fixed thing. God has f- set, he's, you know, like setting a stone in a, in a, a fixture of some kind or setting a, a brick in the mortar. It t- carries that concept of, of being set or fixed in place. And so this is why I believe that this list is actually a list of giftings, at least for the Corinthian church, that was something that was specific. And God put, took some and did these specific things with them. And so we're always over at Ephesians chapter 4, verses, what is it, 6 through 8, saying, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, the motivation gifts are Romans chapter 12, verses 6 to 8. But we're always over there saying, oh, those are the five-fold office gifts. Oh, well, you know, what's, what's, what group is working your church? Oh, we have an apostle and a prophet in our church. <laughs> you, just, you totally missed it, you know. That's not, that's every believer gets one of those. But here you have a different, an, a, again, a different listing of giftings, okay? Um, <clears throat> so God hath set some. It's the first time in Ephesians chapter 4 and in Romans chapter 12 it talks about all. But here it's some. Okay, so he has fixed in a position some in the church. So God has set some in the church. First, apostles. The apostle is the ambassador, so to speak. He's the one that brings the culture of heaven, and he brings that down into the earth. He, 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 he grabs hold of what God's trying to establish now, and he brings it into the realm of experience, and he establishes it here now. Uh, the apostle, in, in this context, the apostle would fall under any type of shepherding leadership. And what we call pastor, which remarkably is found one time in the entire New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, the only place you find the word pastor in the whole New Testament. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, that, that's we, what we think of that. It probably biblically was an apostle because the, po- the apostle was the one that had the oversight of the shepherding of the people. But the pastor teacher would, could also occupy that because the pastor teacher could be an apostle in this, in this sense, in this, in this listing of gifts, okay? So they're apostles. They bring in the culture of heaven. Uh, secondarily, prophets, the inspired speaker, the one that uh, ordains truth. Uh, I mean, God ordains truth, but it's an ordained truth that the, the prophet brings into existence. Uh, the, thirdly, teachers, people that can instruct, that can bring forth truth. And uh, uh, again, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, a pastor teacher there, it's that every believer has access to one of these. But here it's this specific thing, the apostle, the prophet, and the teacher are crucial for the foundational leadership in any type of a ministry or business structure. Okay. Oh, let's see. And the teacher is the instructor. That's the one that brings forth wisdom and truth and, and is able to, to, to encourage and motivate by way of the truth. Uh, after, after that, so you have those three. And then after that, you have miracles. That's dynamic power, uh, a divine force, or miraculous power. Uh, the miracles, so this is someone that has, uh, let's, say, let's say that they have, um, uh, okay, so I'm going to go through them and then I'll come back and say that. I'm sorry. Forgive me for that. Uh, So the divine force, miraculous power of miracles. Then you have gifts of healings. Again, remember we saw that up there in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. It talks about gifts of healing. So this is very important for the corporate body to come together and and have this manifesting on a regular basis. But this is something that's set. So I'm going to come back and talk about that in a minute. You have the gift of helps, which literally means relief. Uh, you know, that, that's probably so crucial and, and missing in so many ministries is people that are anointed to bring relief to other people, to bring relief to situations. You have uh, the gift of governments, which means directorship. These are people that are organizers, administrators, they're rulers. They, they help, they know how to position things and get things moving in the right direction. And then you have diversities of tongues, different types of tongues. And there are many different types of tongues. We know that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 that uh, there's tongues of men and of angels. Uh, my book, I asked you last week to purchase my book, Stammering Lips, Release the Power of Tongues, also available on ifoundme.biz or you can visit our website thronebuilders.org or you can go to amazon.com and you can find it there but 
uh, I'm actually going to be doing a revision because I've had a lot of incredible experiences since I released the book that really expanded my understanding of what both the tongues of men and of angels means. Tongues of men isn't just world languages, it's something more than that. And uh, I'll, I'll save it for the book revision. I won't even get into it here, okay? But there are, there are diversities of tongues. So here you have the Spirit of God moving through Paul to say, hey, this is how God, God set some in the church. And these are the some that he set. There are apostles. Now, this is what I believe the Lord has shown me about this. And if you don't believe, if you don't believe that, that's totally cool. I'm just sharing. It's my Facebook Live. <laughs> so I get to say what I want to say because I, that's how I roll. In any case, um, I believe that first, apostles, I believe that the apostles are there because there's a, 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 an administration of the apostolic nature of the kingdom that they oversee, and that it's not just their rulership over the body, but it specifically has to do with uh, working with the apostles or the apostolic believers. I believe that the, the, uh, the prophets, the same way, he set some. So in a ministry, you should have an apostle that is in leadership and in authority, and he's working to cultivate this apostolic reality to, to specifically find the apostles who can bring the culture of the kingdom and to cultivate and to mold that. And you have uh, the, the prophet, the set thing. You have this prophet, there's some, this prophet that's there. And he, he's, he, his goal is to cultivate the prophetic lifestyle of the ministry. And, and a lot of ministries actually operate like that in some ways, where they have people that are specifically gifted in these different ways, and they're, they're actually bringing forth uh, a, 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 a culture that other young prophets and other young apostles can flow into. Not so much the apostles that, that's happening, but it's less because prophecy has been the thing that's really been popular for a few decades now, but now the apostolic reality is finally starting to get, you know, moving like it needs to move. And then thirdly, teachers. I believe that, that, that what it's saying here is you have apostles responsible for cultivating an apostolic culture and atmosphere and raising up apostles. You have the prophets that are there to cultivate a, a spirit of prophecy and to raise up the young prophets. And then you have teachers that are there to cultivate a mentality. Okay, so you've, you've all heard preachers and just get up and right? But they don't teach. And teachers are good at coming along and saying, let's bring definition to what was said. So the teacher would cultivate a culture of uh, explanation, of uh, expounding, of bringing forth, of defining things that are, that are being uh, said, helping people understand, and teaching others how to teach. You don't have to have the gift of teaching to teach. Some people are just awesome at it. Uh, but others are not so much, but they can still do it. So then after that, so those are, those are the three, seems like those are the three source settings or administration gifts where the Holy Spirit's like, these need to be uh, controlling the, the spirit, the mindset of what's taking place here. But then he says, after that, you have miracles. You have this divine force, a miraculous power. I believe that there are people, uh, like well, Todd Bentley is a great example. Todd White's another great example of healers. I mean, these guys are miracle workers. They just, you know, I don't care. If, I'm not asking if you agree with them. I'm just saying it's undisputable that they walk in tremendous power. And they cultivate that mentality. Bill Johnson out of Reading is another one. He cultivates this reality of miraculous power, miraculous divine force penetrating the dark things and bringing light into reality and shifting things the way that they need to be shifted. And then gift of, give, and I'm, I use healers as an example because that's miraculous. But there are other people that have tremendous ability to miraculously bring in finances, uh, move in miraculous power where broken people uh, uh, shift from that in a moment and they're healed. Hey, hey. Uh, Thomas, I'm not saying hi to everybody. I'm sorry about that. It's it's a lot of people, but I have seen all of you, and I'm so glad that you're here, and, and uh, God bless you, and I really appreciate it. But I uh, apologize if I haven't said your name as I've been teaching because it kind of, um, you know, puts me off my, my game, so to speak, I guess. Uh, 
So then you have gifts of healing. These are the ones that really cultivate that and encourage people, motivate them to really work in healing. And they have people that bring relief. And their, their goal is to help other people see that uh, there are needs that need to be met. And they walk in this anointing of bringing relief, of actually being the person on the scene to, to come alongside and like, like the Holy Spirit. Probably the gift of helps is uh, the gift of helps and the gift of mercy are probably two of the most important, least talked about, and least walked in uh, gifts that are available for us in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, but they're so crucial for us to really learn and expand in. Uh, so you've got, uh, and then you've got governments. That's uh, directorship, leadership. There are people that God has set, it wants to set in ministries that can have the administrative role that needs to be taken. Too many places, it's you know one or two leaders trying to administrate and, and figure out how to do everything, and then you have a board of people making decisions about stuff. Um, ditch the board and find the gifted people that know how to administrate, bring them into accountability with the leadership so that it's understood what's going on, and then allow them to administrate. They can set things up and make things ora bata, make things run so much smoother than they are than they're running right now. And then you have diversities of tongues, and I believe that there is a special gifting. In fact, I think my wife has a special gifting in this, and she's actually been uh, working with a, 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 a gal from the East Coast that that uh, uh, with this, and they're they're actually God is actually giving them. Uh, 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 words, tongues, words, and giving them definitions for them and saying to them, uh, I want you to develop a, a teaching series on this and release this to the body of Christ. And I know it sounds weird, but hey, I don't care. It's cool. It's clearly something. It's this setting in place. It's someone that's in the ministry that's been set there by the Spirit of God to walk in diversities of tongues. And so they're releasing that. Not only are they releasing that, but they're cultivating an atmosphere of that. Tongues is the most important gift that the body of Christ has available to them. And I'm going to get into a little bit about that next week, but I, I do. I would like for you to read my book. I'm not going to go into as much detail as in my book about that. And, and uh, it's so important. And so, so uh, then in verse 29, he says, are all, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? And it's a double negative. So he's basically saying not everybody is this and not everybody is this and not everybody is this. This passage of scripture, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 29 and 30, is the passage that everybody uses to say, see, I don't have the gift of prophecy. See, I'm not this. See, I'm not that. You miss it entirely. What, what Paul is saying here is in this set, remember what it says, God has set some in the church. In this set or fixed environment that the Holy Spirit has placed, so said, that's where I'm going to set you like a fixture, and like a stone in a, in a uh, jewelry fixture, or like a, uh, uh, a brick in the mortar, I'm going to set you, I'm going to fix you right there. And uh, every believer has the gift of tongues. It's in you, I promise you. Um, so uh, so these, these are some that are set. So what Paul is saying is not everybody in a local ministry is going to be an apostle. Not everybody in a local ministry is going to be a prophet. Not everybody in a local ministry is going to be a teacher. Not everybody in a local ministry is going to have these positions of administration, of working of miracles or gifts of healing or speaking in tongues or interpretation. See, every believer has access to all of the gifts of the Spirit, but there are certain ways that the Spirit of God has function. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. Certain believers have a particular and a peculiar motiv motivation. Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. And every believer coming together in fellowship, which is the entire context of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, has access to the, to the uh, manifestation gifts. And uh, but but not every believer is set in a position of leadership and authority administrating uh, the the, uh, the 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 things of the spirit. So it's he's not saying that you know. But it's, that's what he says. Do all speak with tongues? And they're like, see, not everybody speaks in tongues. Not true. 
go to Mark chapter 16. Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe, and they shall speak with new tongues. And when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you see very plainly that Paul is not saying that everybody doesn't have the gift of tongues. He's saying that everybody does have the gift of tongues, but there's a time and a place to use it. Okay, Remember, Paul was dealing with a carnal church. <laughs> the Corinthian church was messed up. I mean, they had, you name it, they had it. I mean, they had division based on who baptized who. They had division based on who taught what. They had division based on uh, who had different gifts. They had division in the Lord's Supper. They had division over hair lengths, for goodness sake. They uh, They thought that it was really cool that this one dude managed to score with his dad's wife and have a sexual relationship. They're like, hey, oh, dude, you score, you know. And Paul's like, guys, you got some issues here. And he came against, he was coming against so many of these wrong mindsets and trying to help them um, bring themselves into alignment with the Spirit of God. You can't take, you can't take every word that's written in 1 Corinthians or any of the epistles for that matter and say that all of it universally applies to all people in all situations throughout all time. That is demonic and it is idolatrous because it completely replaces the leadership of the Holy Spirit and are there, we can learn from it, we can glean principles from it, we can gain understanding from it, we can see how the Spirit moved Paul and his dealings with the churches. Many of the doctrines that are there are universal. They do apply to all people at all times. They're a part of what God wants for us, but they had a context, okay? It'd be like me writing a love letter to my wife and telling her how much I love her and adore her and how precious she is to me. And then a hundred years from now, somebody coming along and saying, hey, Apostle Tom, he, he wrote this letter. Well, oh, you must have been saying that to all the women. That, this applies to all women everywhere from Tom. no. Uh, it applied to her at that moment. Are there things there that could be applied to other people and things? Yeah, of course. So, uh, 1 Corinthians was written to, to correct a very out of control body of believers. It was incredibly carnal. I mean, the whole book starts with Paul saying, You are carnal. Okay, very, very important. So, not everybody's gonna, going to work as an administrator in the gift of healing or in the gift of tongues or interpretation. Isn't it interesting that he says in verse 28, he says, God set some in the church, apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues? Why doesn't he mention interpretation of tongues there? Um, why does he mention it two verses later in verse number 30? I believe that there is some, supposed to be somebody in the body of Christ that is gifted in interpretation that is able to cultivate that atmosphere of, of this is what the Spirit of God is saying. You know, we, we train people to interpret dreams. We train people how to flow in the prophetic. And I realize that it's a gift of the Spirit. Don't get upset when I say train people in the prophetic. In the Old Testament, they had the Spirit of God, but they still had schools of the prophets. And it's the word training is the same word as exercise. It's just learning how to use, learning how to walk in the gift. The gift It's the gift of the Spirit. I get that. But learning how to walk in it. I believe that there are people that are anointed by God. and something you don't see. But they're anointed by God and interpreting the tongue, the, the, the words of the Holy Spirit. And God is set, wants to set them in an administrative position so that they cultivate an atmosphere of that and raise other people up in that. Okay? All right. So then he says in verse 31, But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And then, of course, he goes into 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, let me back up on that. In verse number 28, where he says uh, one of the giftings that he's set in the church is diversities of tongues, that actually carries with it partially, it's not entirely, but it's a part of it, the idea of national languages. So it's almost, um, I remember reading, uh, um, what is it, Eddie L. Hyatt's book, 2,000 Years of Charismatic Christianity, where he does a, a fantastic job of documenting uh, the history of charismata throughout the body of Christ. Shows You know, there a lot of people say, all oh, the gift of tongues ceased for centuries. Not true. It was always, all the gifts of the Spirit have always been flowing. But remember that there are church entities, powerful church entities, that had to rewrite history to break out a lot of the reality of what was really happening. And don't please don't come on here and name it and say, oh, it was this church. Don't do that, okay? Because there might be somebody that's in that thing and they, you know, they're, they're, 
just don't do that. So, uh, but but it actually so it's actually something that the Spirit of God would set in a position of administration that actually flows in languages. Eddie L. Hyatt gives many inferences of people that would live in a local area and and they would they just spoke like French or you know. Uh, English or whatever, Chinese, and, and a visitor from another country would come that only spoke their language, and he had several instances listed there where they would pray for several days and say, Father, I shouldn't have to have an interpreter, I should have interpretation from you. And they were actually able to speak fluently in the other language and understand what they were hearing back. They understood what they were saying, they understood what they were hearing back. So it carries with it that idea, but it doesn't replace the idea of supernatural spiritual languages. It's just like a, um, a, a completion of that. So for, I'm just, I just want to read it because I love it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity... I am nothing, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. <laughs> but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Let me just address that real quick, okay? Because that's the verse that everybody uses to say, see, prophecy and tongues cease. They never say knowledge does, right? Because they know stuff. Uh, so what does it say? It says, charity never faileth. The context is charity. He's showing us a more excellent way, more important than the gifts. Remember, talking to a carnal church that had a serious division thing going on, always having some kind of conflict, and they really had a big thing about the gifts. You know, who's, who's, who's speaking in tongues this week? You know, be like, go to church now. Well, who, you know, who, who got slain in the spirit? Well, I, I don't, I, I didn't. You know, oh, well, you weren't one of the chosen men. You know, back then it was, who spoke in tongues? Oh, I didn't get to, oh, well, it's something wrong with you and God kind of thing. The whole context is a carnal church, and he's trying to show them the gifts aren't what matter when it comes down to the foundation of the whole thing. Charity is. Love is. Love in action. Charity, he says, never faileth. In other words, love just keeps on giving. Love never stops. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Okay, so time out. How many of us have gotten a prophecy that simply failed? Right? I mean, I have. I've gotten prophetic words. Maybe I forfeited it. Maybe somebody else disobeyed. Maybe the person giving me the word was off kilter and got it wrong. But I have had prophecies that failed. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Look, let me tell you what that means. Okay, I'm going to speak in tongues. My tongues just ceased. That's all it means. It means, hey, you're going to come together and you're going to speak in tongues for a while and you're going to get done and you're going to go to the restaurant kind of thing. It's all he's saying. Uh, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. I, personally, I <laughs> think it means you forgot it. I mean, how many of us got like this deep revelation of knowledge from God and five minutes later we're like, no, what was that? You know? It does, it's not saying that the gifts stop. None of the gifts ever stopped. In fact, there's way more that the Holy Spirit wants to reveal. These are just the gifts that these churches that Paul was talking to were able to access. There's so much more for us than what we think we have available. So let me just go through that now that I dispelled that stupid lie. It's, and it's called cessationism. Uh, C-E-S-S-A-N. No, never, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> I just totally lost it. But it's cessationism where it ceased at some point. And never, none of the gifts ever ceased. Verse, three, uh, chap, uh, verse number nine, excuse me. We know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Um, when love baptizes you, the gifts of the Spirit are their need. Their, what's the point? When you really have an encounter with the love of God, uh, it's, the gifts aren't as important. They're not as crucial. Okay? 
When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And he's specifically talking about the, the contention, the division that's present in this church. He says, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. He's talking about a church that's focused on the gift. They're, they're focused on the sensation. And he's saying there's going to come a time when, and he's, through that, you're just kind of like, you're just, you're just throwing it out there. You think you see what's going on, you're just throwing it out there. So the time will come when you'll see clearly. When, when do you have your greatest moments of clarity? It's when you're truly basking in the love of God. And may God give us that tonight. I just declare that over us tonight, that the love of God would come in and do a great work. It says, now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. The love of God, encounters with the love of God, I'm declaring over every one of you that watch, is watching this right now and everyone that comes to see this afterward, I'm declaring over you, I'm declaring over myself, I'm declaring over my team, I'm declaring over the body of Christ, I'm declaring over my nation, I'm declaring over the leadership in my country and the leadership in your country. I declare and decree right now that love encounters with the Father are being poured out upon his children. I release that into your life right now. And every mindset, every heart set, every belief that you have that would hinder or limit that reality, I renounce its presence in your life right now. And I say, come out right now. No more. You have no place in the hearts of God's people anymore. Usharabata. You cannot keep the children of God from the love of their papa anymore. And I just release, Father, I release your love all over your people right now. And I thank you that that is truly the greatest prize available to us. And truly the greatest joy is to be touched by your precious love. There are some hurting people on this thread tonight. And I ask, Papa, that you would magnify yourself to them by your love. Pour forth, yes, pour forth your love into the hearts of your people. Release, release, release the love of God into the hearts of your people right now. <laughs> release joy, 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 joy of the Holy Spirit into your life right now. And I declare that this is the, your lot. This is your portion. Encounters with the love of God. And everything else pales in comparison when you get to sit in daddy's lap and feel the embrace and, and experience the glory of his love. And so I release that in your life tonight. That's the will of God for you. And I know you're excited about spiritual gifts, but don't worry about that for a little while. Just let daddy give you some love. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we will be back. We're going to be posting our new uh, teaching times. We're kind of rearranging things a little bit. And we'll be back to talk about that. Uh, be advertising that a little bit really soon. So God bless you. Thank you so much for being here tonight, and we'll talk to you later.